Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alvana, Alvana and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, we are excited to discuss this topic and also be joined by some amazing speakers today, Mr. Bevan Lane, uh, Ms. Tess Hera, and Mr. Terence Fogarty. Before we get started, I'd like to inform you that this session is being recorded and will be posted on our website, YouTube channel, along with the slides of the presentation. You will all get the link to watch the session as soon as our team publishes it on the website. Furthermore, we encourage you to participate by submitting your questions anytime using the Q&A feature in the chat box in the GoToWebinar platform. We will address the questions in the last 15 minutes of the session, so stay tuned for that. Now, without further ado, let's get started, and I'm going to hand it over to our first speaker, Bevan. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the, another one of these really good PCB webinars. I've, I've been lucky enough to be involved in quite a few. Um, today's topic, as you can see, is we're going to be talking about ISO 27,035 and 42001 and how you bring them together. Um, the focus is very much on AI and governance, but obviously, instant response is a critical aspect of AI. So there are other presenters. So we're going to go into an introduction now so you can... Uh, Find out more about the three of us if we can get this to work. So we'll talk about the standards. Um, so the agenda for today is we're going to do the welcome introductions. To, then we're going to talk about inter response, the standard and inter response. Then we'll go into artificial intelligence and some very interesting stuff about artificial intelligence and how you do governance. Um, and once we've spoken specifically about those two standards, then we're going to go into talking about how you bring them together. And I hope that that's the part where most of you will get the most value, where we're talking about how we bring standards together. The most important aspect for me of setting up any of these standards is risk assessments and risk management. So we'll bring it all together right at the end and talk about how we collate artificial intelligence and incident management risks. And then hopefully there's some time for you to, to ask questions and, and do a bit of a Q&A afterwards. Um, introductions on the three of us um, is myself. Uh, we are waiting for Terence Fogarty, who, I don't know if he has joined us yet, who I think he might be having some technology issues. He'll come in a bit later if he does come in. Um, I'm a director of a company, uh, a group of company called the InfoSec Advisory Group. We are based in Cape Town and uh, South Africa. You can see I've got a couple of commas there because we added a few certifications and took them out. I do have about uh, 15 uh, PCB certifications. I'm just putting the two top ones at the end there. Um, and But the one that obviously is a critical one for here is I do have the 42001 one. I actually do have the 27 and 35 one as well. And that does help us a lot to understand the differences and the nuances of, of all these standards. Uh, my colleague Terence, who we're still hoping is going to join us in a while, he set up most of these slides uh, and has put a lot of work into this presentation. So I really hope he is able to join us. He also has extensive experience, PCB certifications um, across and is heavily involved in instant response which, and pen testing, which is why we want him on this call. And then over to you, Tess, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Bivan. So I am Teshwari Hira. Uh, I'm the Chief Data Management and Security Officer at Mauritius Telecom Group. If you are uh, based in Mauritius, I hope you know where it is. I know there is uh, <laughs> attendees from all around the world. So I have uh, over 15 years plus experience in cyber leadership, expertise in serving uh, client organizations in multiple industries, and now uh, internationally, mostly in the Middle East and Africa, and now back to Mauritius in the telecom industry. So I've proven track record of leading cybersecurity and privacy uh, practices and have worked closely with many CSUs and board to define successful cyber strategies, develop effective cyber risk quantification model, lead technology enablement, 
measure cyber resilience index, such as uh, in sectors like telecoms, financial, hospitality, nuclear power plants, smart and cognitive cities, marine and logistic industries. So I've also led the um, cyber security and data protection regulation compliance and raise awareness to promote cyber security culture in uh, Mauritius Telecom. Uh, just to mention, I mean, I, I don't have a certification there, but I am part of the ISO 27000 lead implementer. I was uh, part of the privacy leading team who was certified among one of the 10 first company in the world for the uh, privacy certification. Ah, brilliant. And <laughs> okay, I, I think it's a great, great introduction. Uh, I do. Um, I want to stress now just how useful the three people on the panel are because the, the combination of security, AR, incident response, and privacy experience. And you can hear from Tess; she's going to talk quite a bit about those sort of aspects and how you bring it together. Um, so understand that with AR by itself is very heavily reliant on privacy, security, and incident response. Those are critical aspects I think most of the new regulations are focusing on. I think that's something we will talk quite a bit about in, in this webinar. I can see Theron's going for a minute and he just disconnected, so hopefully he'll be there soon. <laughs> okay, you've seen that. Okay, that's good news. Okay, um, do you, um, then I'll, I'll start on the first slide on 27,035 then. Uh, as you can talk a little bit about the AR stuff. So might as well help out on this bit. Um, you know that obviously 27,035, like a lot of the standards, has been going through a lot of changes. And I do like the fact that the new versions of most of these standards are being updated. Um, and when they're being updated, they're bringing a lot more about privacy and where they can about artificial intelligence. Um, this inter-response standard has got, as you know, lots of versions to it. It's not just a once-off. It's got the pre, the during, and the post uh, implementation. It's 27,035, um, But it's a very good standard to give you a comprehensive view of incident response. And anything can be plugged into it. So when you are looking at something like artificial intelligence, you are plugging in a component or something which fits quite nicely because it's got an overall approach with the pre, the during, and the post. Okay. Um, the cool things about 27,035 is that we're looking at how do you use response to minimize the impact of an incident? How do you deal with regulatory compliance? Um, it can be very good in terms, obviously, in terms of enhancing security, but the biggest component of having a 27,035 approach is structure. Having a structured response which can deal with things quickly, effectively, um, and return to normal. Uh, it's like I said, go and have a look at the latest version of it. It has been enhanced considerably in the last two years um, as they've broken up the new standards. All right, no Terence yet, guys. I'll carry on then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, in, in terms of incident security management, um, the main objectives of the 27,035 standard are, as I was mentioning now, in terms of a framework. Um, but when you look, there's the pre-stuff. So there is, when you set up the preparation, um, you start preparing for what you're gonna do. Um, then you go into a decision phase. Where you, when you see, uh, you come up with, how do I assess and understand what to do about an incident? You go into response because now you've understood. So good example, we're preparing for what happens if we have a ransomware attack. And now with the new AR stuff, think about how much ransomware is adjusting and adapting. We look at and understand that it is a ransomware attack, we make a decision based on, on what we saw, we respond to, but sometimes we might get it wrong when we do a response. But the objectives are very clear. If you got it wrong because you actually didn't understand the assessment well, you go back and you reassess. And that's why the cycle is like this. Once you've finished up and you've done a response, you look to have a lessons learned. I told you about the three different standards. What can we learn from that incident? This is a critical part of incident response and it's a critical part of artificial intelligence as well. How do we look at things and how do we improve them once we've um, set things up? Um, the other objectives around incident management are how do you detect, um, setting up a framework and how do you prevent, which is a really good one. So it's not just 
picking up of incidents and to actually preventing incidents from happening again. Okay, so everything is tied together into one framework, but these components are the critical aspects of incident security management. So when we look at AI in incident management, we can look at different components. And these are the technical ones where you'll see it's a direct in connection with how does artificial intelligence help you when we're doing incident management. And most of you would have seen that the tools um, for security have over the last, even as long as probably 10 years ago, started talking about integrating artificial intelligence into the way that they are, are preventing and responding to incidents. The latest um, last two or three years, there's been a huge increase in AI coming through in terms of these tools. So the critical ones we're speaking about, Jenna, you'll see is IDS, so Intrusion Detection Systems, XDR, which is uh, alliteration for antivirus has moved into a phase where it's gone from something called endpoint detect and respond through now to extended detection response. So now forensics is included in the way that um, these XCR solutions are doing it as well. And they're doing a lot more prevention, a lot more response than just what antivirus was necessarily doing in the past. Um, so is now when we're taking the whole SIMS and we are actually creating, looking um, and doing orchestration and, and understanding how to bring things together and, and look for differences and, and funnies in terms of network traffic. Uh, things like Dark Trace gives you email and there's a lot of email security solutions out there, but the latest versions now are using extensive amount of artificial intelligence to go into an email and to look at traffic and to understand how to actually look for malicious uh, things within the traffic. The, the older versions of, of email security were very um, dependent on looking at patterns, looking at obvious things in headers. Then the new ones are now using artificial intelligence to look for malicious scripts, look for details into the email. Um, yeah, um, Devin, ah, Devin, there we go. Great. The techie guys, was, yeah. Just, Save the day. <laughs> just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Some connection issues initially there, but um, yeah, maybe we should just caveat. Um, obviously, with the slide, we have mentioned some vendors that we're not affiliated with any of the vendors. It's mm -hmm. just more to to give examples, and you can see obviously there's quite a few different diverse um, organisations there. Obviously, all in the security space, but uh, yeah, we're just trying to illustrate that, that um, there are obviously products that facilitate a lot of these different um, AR components in incident management. Uh, but once again, there's no real affiliation and we're not trying to promote any particular products just to just have that caveat in there. Okay, do you want to carry on? <laughs> now that you're uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> sure, um, yeah, happy to, to jump in. So I think the, the next one there was around the patch management uh, aspect. So I think we've seen a lot of uptake around applications where they um, will look for, uh, do first of all, like full asset discovery to determine what those assets are. I think. The, if we look back 10 years, it was always a case of, okay, I've got to identify all the assets, I've got to go and configure certain IP addresses to for those asset management applications to, uh, to first of all see those assets, even if they're outside of my environment. And then um, but by, with these different AR components now inherently built into these type of applications, and once again, that's just an example there, where um, it's saying, okay, we're, we're, um, what, what kind of um, threshold do we want to set? Do we want to update uh, sort of immediately do we want to give, give it a bit of a time period and do a sort of uh, n minus one approach um i mean i think we saw with crowdstrike that um to nitpick on them their name's not up there but uh, obviously they were in the news on the they had quite a big issue back on the 17th of july and um they're from a, a SaaS point of view or a, a software as a service they pushed down a, a configuration uh, the channel file and caused that obviously that mass outage from a production perspective where um, all the machines went into a constant reboot cycle and having so I think we must just kind of weigh up the pros and cons when it comes to this because if you are doing it in an auto, auto update perspective then um, it will have instantaneous updates and you don't have that kind of like internal QA as part of it so even though we're saying a lot of these tools can be used quite comprehensively in an incident management point of view using these AI capabilities we, we must keep in mind that um, it must be uh, company dependent and, and obviously risk um, within certain risk thresholds. And then just onto that last one there around the, the SIEM side. So um, I think we're getting definitely a lot more uptake. 
I think in the olden days of this of, of, of log management was particularly uh, collecting the logs and there would always be a case of um, having an individual to review those logs and setting up co comprehensive SOC services to be able to review those but we're finding a lot of integration I could have actually we could have actually put um, seam slash SOC there and there's a lot of capabilities now that have inbuilt um, identification processes so if there's uh, let's say a denial of service attack then um, the, the AI will pick up in that, that traffic forms within that type of signature um, and then goes even one step further and tries to look at um, OSINT based uh, signatures and then compare those and say okay this looks like this type of control and uh, we're finding with you know the example there around um, IBM's QRadar where they've used Watson as a separate AI agent to be able to talk to the um, that product and um, there's been quite a few different developments that um, I've just doing a bit of research um, on the past, past weekend and there's an application that also allows for uh, being able to query uh, tickets for example so in the incident management side you can say what is the response time set out for uh, all, all, all of these tickets how long what's the average mean time all of those you can ask it from a, almost as if you would on chat GPT to say yeah um, ask those questions and, and get a response back and in a bit of much succinct format other than trying to find your way through dashboards and and go through that um, that process. All yeah, right. any, cool. Kevin, Tess, any any other areas you want to, or can we jump onto the, the next one? Let's see, Tess, is there anything else to add to that? But I do think it's a massive topic, and it's quite something we obviously have to cover in, in a bit of detail. As Terry said, we've got to be careful on. There's so many vendors that can do this stuff, but. There are risks. I like the fact that you jumped on that, that there are issues we must be aware of. Don't just trust in artificial intelligence, be aware of those things. And we'll come back to that later. Perfect, yeah. Mm -hmm. And That's then, true. yeah, just onto the, the next mm -hmm. slide there. Yeah. Can you just see it? To the, there we go, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's on yours. You had a very slow <laughs> connection there, I think. <laughs> this is a hundred big line, but uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah. Um, so one of the things that we just want to talk about, and uh, so we're not really advocating the use of either of these uh, applications. Um, I actually, was at another conference where I heard a speaker talk uh, about these and found, did a bit of research around it, and most of these. These both fraud GPT and Worm GPT both have a subscription cost to them, where it's um, and more from a dark web. You can see by the quite intimidating graphic there that uh, it's uh, more from a, a dark web perspective. But um, these are, are generally used for that purpose. Now, why I'm bringing this up is that we, as on the um, white hat side, need to try and look know of these applications and obviously try and prevent them um, in our environment and having counter applications that. Have a positive um, element to it. So we we need to as there's more AI tools um, to be able to, to be able to well you can see they uh, generate phishing emails, create uh, different types of ransomware and, and malware, and obviously all different types of scams that go with that. That um, these are the kind of type of tools that attackers are using. So from an incident point of view, is that we need to look at what other AI tools are in place to to counter that um, and perhaps look and I, I think there's a lot of security one thing in the security realm is there's usually a, a quite a sort of open source community out of it and there's generally a lot of um, sharing of resources which which has always been quite a good I avenue mean, maybe not as much as we'd like like in this situation as these obviously uh, I want to say commercial but a, a dark web commercial so um, once again we're not um, it's just a case of being aware of these type of applications so we can counter them not obviously once again encouraging use for it all right, great. Yeah, there, there's a multitude of them out there. I think these are really good examples to get your head into just how significant the use of AI is. A lot of uh, presentations I've seen where they actually mention that they the use cases on artificial intelligence attacks are quite small. They don't find too many of direct artificial intelligence attacks, but they but they are seeing that its potential is going to be massive as it starts increasing. Mm. Okay. You want to yeah, talk about the business? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I suppose those. I mean, we've really seen it from uh, maybe just last element out of that is that uh, we've seen it a lot in the development world where uh, you know, um, I was listening to a talk the other day and they were mentioning about how programming 
used to be quite fundamental to teach uh, teach our kids to to program from a young age and now um they had a bit of a i don't fully agree with that i think it's still quite fundamental to have that uh, those kind of concepts in mind there's so much that can be generated um so much code that we've seen out of you know something like ChatGPT or, or copilot in that, that, that area um, so it's it's changing the world of development and obviously with that developing scripts for um for cyber security uh, different ai tools can be used to do that um obviously once again from a, a white hat perspective yeah let's jump onto the to the risks there then um so obviously when we are talking about the, the relating it back to the standard here is that um one of the fundamentals is to create a, uh, and I'm sure this is quite part and parcel for any of your environments as well, is to create a quite a fundamental um, incident response plan. Uh, we've seen many organizations where they say, yeah, they have a rock solid uh, plan in place. And then, um, and Tess, I'm sure you've experienced that the same with, with other organizations where they, um, but it might look like everything's covered. And then when you do the simulation testing for that, it's, um, it's far from the truth and it's been updated only three years ago. So, uh, we you definitely want to make sure that that's um, that's covered as part of um, obviously once again to align to 27035. Uh, expertise, the skill gap. I mean, I think we could have a whole separate talk about that alone. But uh, yeah, um, implementing any of the incident response without having we, we spoke earlier about the SOC elements built into it, and you know having a a team all making use of those different AI components for it is is obviously fundamental to um, sort of bridging that gap where um, uh, yeah, individuals obviously need to familiarize themselves with not only the, the ISO itself, but um, but also having the technical elements quite, quite combined. I think incident management in general is quite tricky for that because it requires both a technical element and a governance level understanding. And um, that's maybe why there's a, a very um, limited uh, recent sort of skills in that, uh, in that domain. Outdated procedures kind of ties into the plan itself. Here we're talking obviously more of a policy level um when it comes to to these and, and obviously as the new standards come out it's 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 really recommended to organizations to update their their policies according to new standards i mean they're obviously built for a reason and, and taking sort of best practice into uh, into account and um you know developing those those policies because you've got the, the these i suppose available it's it's um definitely worthwhile making use of them uh third party risk also could be a separate <laughs> i'm sure both Bevan and Tess could talk about that as well uh, but uh, yeah, we, we do find that there's, I mean, we've seen cases, there was a case a while back around the Walmart situation where they were hacked through an HVAC system and um, having your incidences uh, occurring through a third party and then having such drastic ramifications to an internal organization, into the organization is, uh, um, is obviously a risk that you need to accommodate for. So, um, and I think that's why there's been a lot of push towards the like SOC, SOC 2, there's NIS 2 now as well, and things like DORA, the uh, Digital Operations Resilience um, Act as well, that look at those kind of aspects around third party management, risk management, because it's so fundamental. Uh, the technology side, I mean, you can get by without having a fancy application, you can do it in, in Excel, but uh, yeah, it is, it is um, I mean, we've seen it drastically with, with clients that, that we deal with where um, having that kind of uh, sophisticated application, and this is one scheme where the AI components can come into with, you know, ticketing to say, okay, there's been an incident, here's all the, the, the various lines of approval that need to be performed, various workflows from that. And then um, for the, the last one there just deals with the um, doing any sort of post review. It's, it's, it's obviously quite fundamental to keep, if you're not checking uh, or, or uh, checking each of the steps or maybe having a, a independent um, party to review those processes uh, it's quite easy to kind of get lost in the sort of fog of war of things and, um, and not being able to kind of take a step back and look at where all those those concerns are all those risks are around around incident management all right mm -hmm. yeah thank you very much and, and as you say there's a much bigger list of risks but i think those are the critical ones very well covered oh for sure yeah 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 it's definitely just the the other all right. Uh, over to Tez. Tez, yeah, you've had a long time to wait. Look forward to your. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's very interesting. I'll just speak from what uh, Terence just mentioned. I think we've talked about the data, data security and also uh, privacy concern, which is one of the biggest risks of AI. And what was just elaborated was about how 
uh, AI is being is being used in a good way and a bad way, both by the defender side and both by the uh, attacker side that is that are using AI to 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 have some kind of gains or have some kind of protection. And this is where actually uh, because of the ability of AI, uh, like we say the the. the the simplest definition of AI is um, its term has to be very complex, very fast. We have seen the amazing uh, um, time that it has taken to, you know, come on the scene just recently, and very uncertain also with all the risks that we are going to elaborate later, and yet very powerful. So to be able to manage such kind of technology, especially this one being a powerful one, it was very important that we have this kind of standard to very articulate the governance of the application of AI, right? So as you can see, uh, the ISO 42001 is the world's first AI management system, providing a valuable guidance for the rapidly changing field of technology. Of course, like any other governance framework, it uh, provides opportunities for managing risk. And it demonstrates the responsible use of AI because I think this is, uh, it's kind of looks simple, but there is a more ethical value of how we're using AI by from the one who is developing it and the one who is consuming it. And some of the risks that will be talked later related to the trustability, to the transparency, to the reliability of the tool. Also, it's good to mention that uh, this kind of, of uh, standard is uh, actually, when it was developed, most of the conversation it was for entity providing or utilizing the AI-based product and services. And it ensure, like I said, mentioned just now, the responsible development and the use of AI. So it was designed to, designed to oversee the various aspects of AI, and it also provided an integrated approach to manage AI project from a risk perspective and also to, man, to effectively treat the kind of risk that we're going to elaborate in a moment. Uh, just to add on what uh, um, Deren said on the data and the privacy risk that will be covered again in detail, later and and uh, uh, this kind of risk what we have seen there is a drastic change in the cyber threat landscape where before when we were talking of, of uh, cyber attack automated cyber attack now is taking over so uh, i think you've seen the amount of uh, time that is being taken for an ai to break out a password is 50 to 70 percent more compared to other so how do are we prepared to say how do we you know, counter counter rock with this kind of, of attack is where AI is used to counter counter attack AI as well. And, and, and again, we'll be providing more insight uh, later. Maybe you can move to the next slide, Viva, where we talk about the um, objectives of, uh, exactly, the objectives of, uh, of AI. So as you can see, um, as per the standard, there are many around seven objectives of AI that has been elaborated. Uh, accountability, of course, developing this kind of tool which is being used internally or used by your customer, there is an aspect of accountability that needs to be taken in, 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 into consideration. When we are talking of AI expertise, doesn't need, you know, only there is a myth that, okay, this is only about, you know, the expert with data scientists, data management, very key, very important, but also all the people involved from the time of the use case gathering, understanding the importance of what we want as output is very important. So how do you onboard all these expertise or users of AI in any any project is very key. So that's one of the objectives to make sure you know all you don't leave out anyone but you take all the stakeholders on board when you work on this kind of project. Availability and quality of training and test data, this is also very key. So if we ask ourselves how are LLMs being trained today? Most of our LLMs are being trained normally on the internet. And um, this is where even the intellectual property infringement come into, come into uh, 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 discussion because the information available on the internet, we know there is a lack of, uh, of, uh, of protection to those intellectual property rights. And uh, what happens, LLMs then move, tend to move to shift this is what organizations are doing. They are making the LLMs to learn on uh, established work or people IP so that they can give more favorable output. 
and what is happening also today when you're training your LLMs on website. Most of the website today we've seen the shift happening also on that side is LLMs are being trained on uh, on on the website, which are eventually generated uh, by Gen AI and created by Gen AI. So you are making your LLMs to be your your AI to be trained by Gen AI, and obviously what you will see down the line is uh, the degradation of those kind of performance. So you need to be very careful when you're training the test data, when you're training your LLMs, what kind of data you're using. Environmental impact, uh, there is a prediction of skyrocketing of power uh, in the future because more LLMs, more means more power, better language, strong, lang uh, strong infra means you're going to consume more energy. So organizations who are having ESG commitment, I think there is a balance to be made there. So that should be one of your objectives. Fairness, very important. I'm not going to into the details. We're talking about fairness and bias later. Maintainability, because this is an evolvement. Your LLMs, your AI is going to evolve. Everything you're putting, it is a learning for them. So how do they continue to um, continue to learn and making sure they're taking the right governance? Privacy, we've talked about, you know, lots of PII during the data training, how they are, are making sure that all the PII of, that are being uh, processed is in line with the data privacy laws, such as the DPA or the GDPR. And other objectives, like you see robustness, safety, security, we've talked about transparency, very key, which is important for trust that we're going again to be touched later. So in law, in all these are the objectives that has been highlighted in the uh, ISO standard. Next, next. I don't know whether Terence or Vivan, you have something to add in here? Terence, you want to jump in there? But I do see very, very different to what was in the incident response. I think that's the first thing from our mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously, we, we have some further slides that talk about the areas that there obviously are those overlaps, but um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's two different school of thoughts here, and um, obviously, what's something that we wanted to tackle is where, where they sort of line up and how best we can utilize both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, so the, the section now is, is about artificial intelligence and how to govern it and how to put stuff. So taking from Tez's, uh objectives there and, and looking at what she was talking about, AI, she, she overlapped very nicely with what was happening in response. Um, but then when we looked at the objectives, you saw they were quite different. Now we're going into objectives of what artificial intelligence governance is about. Um, that, you know, it's a model and, and what's happening with the model is we need some sort of connection to data. And, and data governance is the critical aspect. With artificial intelligence, we'll see a strong connection with what is happening with, Tez mentioning already, with development. So what is happening there with the development function and how are they using AI and how are they making sure that they look at what is important in terms of the governance of artificial intelligence. And when you look here on the slide, you'll see that data governance is the, the, the the be all and end all, the thing that governs everything. Then artificial intelligence governance is a subset of that. So you're looking at AI and saying, how do I govern AI within data governance? You shouldn't be looking at it separately. And that's why this picture is critical for you to understand that artificial intelligence is not something which should be done completely by itself because it has such a strong connection into data governance, which of course, as I mentioned earlier, is very closely connected to privacy and security. So Privacy, security, and data governance are critical components um, or critical over and governing factors of AI governance. And when you look at those definitions there, you'll see that data governance is on managing the integrity and use of data, but how the way that you do data governance directly influences the effectiveness of AI governance, okay? Because the inputs into our systems are reliable and free from bias. That word bias, I'm gonna talk about ethics and, and bias um, throughout my, the slides I'm talking about specifically. But bias is one of the fundamental things we are concerned about. There's some really good case studies of where things will come up and they immediately start biasing their decisions based on the information that you used from 30 years ago in terms of, for example, insurance, you know, should we give insurance, what insurance price? And if you use some examples of, of youngsters, we immediately have to pay far more insurance. 
but these tools with bias might make decisions based not just on your age but on where you based um, your your sex your you know the sections the places you live in and use it and create a system which is biased from the beginning um, because they're using information from a long time ago some of that bias is correct in factually or statistically but it raises a lot of other questions and there have been some really good case studies already people have picked up how AI systems are, are inherently biased and in some cases as bad as, as as sexist and racist because of the decisions that they make so be very careful in terms of that anybody want to jump in yeah. on that yeah there, 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 there was an example on Amazon. Sorry, sis. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I was just going to mention, yeah, Bevan, on, on that particular example, I know there was the case around Amazon where uh, mm -hmm. it was about five years ago where they we were developing a lot of the, the models and they were looking through different um, uh, different CVs. And the thing is that um, they just for certain very technical positions that was quite male dominated. And then the uh, the, the CVs, when it went through that, um, that process of, of analyzing it, it would favor only, only men um, so and, and not considering all the, the you know the, the skills of that individual and whatnot so there's been so many other examples I know Google images has also had their fair share of issues around mm -hmm. that trying to bring up um, like, you know, um, different images that uh, aren't particularly what you're searching for but um, because of that kind of confirmation bias or the, the the AI being fed those kind of biases that it, it generates it and I think from it even just on chat GPT I mean um, you know, we were having conversations with some clients the other day where I don't think they were fully understanding that every all the information, talking about information being uploaded or data governance in this aspect is that information that's uploaded on ChatGPT becomes part of their model. And then obviously as they release a new model, it becomes part of that <laughs> entity. So uh, it's something to keep in mind that, uh, and I think a lot of companies have tried to put a bit of a, a front end or a proxy to that and develop a front end where feeding information in where uh, it's sanitized in some method prior to getting uploaded to you know, models such as ChatGPT. So then at least your company information isn't becoming part of that um, because of the, part of that model. And uh, I suppose if you go even one step further than that is, but, but there have been um, cases where people have fed um, ChatGPT like false information on purpose to get it to do incorrect things. Um, on top of the normal things like spelling, like not being able to work out how many R's there are in strawberry. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just quite interesting. Yeah, sorry, we'll jump back to you there. Sorry, Paul. Yeah, no, I just, just wanted to <laughs> add on what uh, um, Ivan just said is like, why the, the only reason why AI governance is a subset of data governance, I mean, at the epicenter of AI, the only thing that matters is data, right? So if you remove the data from the AI, there's nothing. So everything is related to what is going in, what is being processed, and what is coming out. So uh, just to add, uh, data governance has been there for years, and, and AI governance is quite a recent development, And but it is very critical for the safety deploying and the governing of AI at scale for reducing this. Uh, just to add more onto the data governance, the only demand that I can is data governance ensure the quality and the security of the data to minimize the risk of bias errors or when the data is being used to train an AI and, and AI governance is more to ensure that the AI system is using the algorithms themselves behaving ethically transparently and without bias so that's a kind of demarcation of these two governance but they are very very closely interlinked Okay, thank you very much, guys. Yeah, it was very, very enlightening. And I, I do think this is very much a topic that I, I think all of you should be really interested in, in going to much more detail, understanding the impact. Um, I see to, there we go, <laughs> seems to be slow again. Um, we've spoken quite a bit about this. Just just be aware that obviously the EU laws are bringing this more to, to dominance. The new EU law that came out this year has really is focusing on ethics, bias, anything related to humanity and trying to protect us, trying to protect what AI really from us, or sorry, from us, us from AI. The way AI needs to be done should be done in the fairest way possible. And the EU laws are very strong on ethics and bias. And, and this is an entire topic uh, that, again, we can go into massive detail on, but understand it when you are looking at this it's far bigger than security it, it comes very strongly into this area 42001 has got specific controls on these 
But those controls are written at quite a high level. So you would have to really, if you're going to take this seriously, go and do quite a lot of research and probably focus a lot on what this EU law is talking about in terms of bias and ethics, um, because it's a very good guideline um, for how you would govern how you do that. All right, so the integration of this, um, the bringing the two standards together, there's quite a lot of slides we're going to talk about at the end where we come back to this. But the, the, the both the standards, so 30, 27,035 is an addendum to 27,001. And it's not necessarily the same as a management system because it's talking about how to do its response. But you wouldn't be able to really integrate 27,035 into, a, you have to have a management system to be able to do it fully. But 42001 is a full-on management system. And if you go and look at 42001, you will see that it's derived from the quality standard from 9001. Most of the management systems, if not every single management system, is derived from 9001. So I do believe something to think quite seriously about is when you're doing any management system, is if you were clever, you would actually go and just implement the QMS and have a very fundamentally strong quality system. If your quality, because everything lies into an AI as a component, could be used then as a component of quality. Whatever you're doing with artificial intelligence, whatever you're doing with development, whatever you're doing with security, should roll out based on quality. Okay, and I do I stress that a lot because people, a lot of people don't know that, that 9001 is the alpha and omega of standards. So quality, when you go look at 42001, all you'll see is I've replaced the word quality with AI in the standard. So they've just said, how are you doing AI in, in terms of planning? How are you looking at AI risks instead of quality risks? If you were to take quality as your fundamental and just slot AI into it, it, it would be a, a very clever way of doing this. Um, so always understand that is a, is a, a fundamental advantage for me. Um, Defence is always going to be responding to to attackers, and it's it's one of the things we talk a lot about in terms of security. So again, with AI, it will be the same thing. You can make a lot of mistakes, you can get the bias wrong, you can make ethical issues, but when it comes to 27,035 and its response, the attackers are always going to be coming up with new ways of using AI, and defence is going to have to respond to that. So again, fundamentals are the way to go fundamentals in terms of structure, in terms of responding quickly, in terms of understanding what your objectives are. All those things we spoke about early are critical because you'd be able to actually come up with um, ways that don't necessarily respond to um, AI changing the whole time because it's much more about fundamentals being applied. But when you then see the attackers are using AI in new ways, we are gonna to have to use our defense in a new way. Um, and, and update our defense and, and integrate whatever we learn from the attackers into our use of, of defense of AI. So, and that ties into that constant evolution of attacks. It, it, those things are critical in terms of the integration of it. Um, the guys are going to talk more about risk management now for both those standards, but it's, for me, it's the first way, to, first thing to look at, understanding really what your AI risks are and what into response risks are, and then bringing that together. What are the actual risks related to the use of AI and, and incident response? How do we bring incident management and AI together through risks and understanding what those risks are? And we spoke about ethics quite a bit, but the last aspect of that slide there talks about PR, about privacy, and how do we protect PR? How do we protect our individuals? How do we protect humans? Um, by using what, what we're doing here. And of course, an attacker is not going to think like that. They're not going to be thinking about protecting humans and protecting PR. They're doing the exact opposite. They're trying to take advantage of humans and try to take advantage of our PR. So there's a lot more to the slide. This was done pretty quickly, but I do think it gives you that first thinking about the integration of these two standards. Okay, I'm going to jump into the next one so that the guys can talk about risk. If you do want to add anything, obviously, to my slides while you're talking about risk, guys, go for it. I think, Teza, you go first. Eh? Yeah, so, yeah, putting to what you've just said, like everything when we talk of management system, there's a risk assessment that has to be done. And I'm going to touch not all of them, we're not going to be uh, finishing over the time. So only the particular 
one which is about very related to to risk and like all new technologies and particularly with this powerful one they are a lot associated one data privacy data security which we, we've talked and there is about the transparency and fairness and bias which i'm going to touch uh, and the remaining as well so one common mistake that we usually do and this is normal what we have seen actually is a left out topic in all industrial revolution is the discussion of risk so even in the digital transformation, moving from macro computers to computers to, to software to internet to cloud, security has been discussed as a aftermath. So here what we've tried to, I mean, we didn't categorize that, but normally risks are categorized like strategic risk, uh, uh, reputational risk, operational risk, or, or, or uh, regulatory risk, right? So here if I highlight on the transparency risk, transparency is about how you instill trust and you bring confidence in AI model, right? Uh, normally, when I can trust a person is when I can, I, I know the person, I know how, it, how he interacts, I know what he can think about something, what I'm doing. But if you're putting some information in your system and you don't know what's happening inside and you just get an output, so how do you really ask yourself whether what is coming out is right or wrong? So when would women, women have trust in an AI model is when they know what is a decision being taken by the model at each step. Why is a decision being taken? Will it make the same decision next time if you gave the same use cases? And what is the confidence of the decision made? And, and in case the decision is wrong also, so how do you really tweak the decision or correct the decision? There's a lot of, I don't have any answer to that, but there's a lot of research which is happening. There's two more, two concepts associated to transparency which is being talked, like explainability and interpretability. Explainability is more about how the, the system gets the number, so how it eventually comes to that conclusion. And inter interpretability is about how the user himself, when he's getting that output, how he does conceptualize contextualize rather the the output so like i said very very early stage of of research and uh, moving to the moving to the next one which is on the uh, fairness and bias so bias a very key but unfortunately uh, again very insufficiently defined building block of trustworthiness which is produced uh, as bias in system or in AI products, right? So if you want to, to define bias, bias in AI happens when an AI model or algorithm discriminate against certain group. So it produces kind of a undesirable outcome and doesn't provide a fair judgment or a, a fair assessment. Uh, bias can happen at any stages of a, of a AI. So, for example, if a data is unjust and have biases in them, eventually the model will also learn and propagate the same thing. And it will create something unconscious and involuntary opinion that will inform our decision. Right. Uh, I've just read uh, an example of bias. If I have, I, I'll just go for quickly, whereby there's, there's someone who traveled, we was traveling and had to get the visa on our arrival. So he was basically from China. So when he got to the destination, he was scanning his passport and trying to, to follow the step, which was obviously being done by AI, because this is a, you know, a, a step by step procedure, very uh, straightforward. So he was he was doing that. And he scanned his photo one time, he, 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 he took his his picture. And the AI couldn't recognize because he was with no offense, he was from the Chinese community. So uh, his eyes was a bit smaller compared to other people. So the AI couldn't de detect whether his eyes were actually open was closed. So he was prompted like, you know, open your eyes. So he tried one time, two time, three time, and he, he didn't get his visa. So it's kind of, you know, biased because that particular AI, he was not trained in the context of that, uh, of many people coming to the country, of the physiognomy, of the language, of the context. And it was the train. So if that is not done properly, I mean, you will have such kind of, of decision. We've talked about the security and privacy. I'm not going to talk about it again. Strategic risk, I think, because why it is a risk? Because, I mean, we do, even with all the risks, we're not, we not here to say, okay, stop and all of that. And, and because it's a risk, actually what we're saying is 
you need to take it into consideration and move forward. So the strategy, uh, AI is a strategy imperative today. I mean, you don't have any questions here to stay. You have to do with it, but you have to do it quietly. ESG, I've touched a bit earlier how uh, you manage your AI system together with your ESG uh, commitment. IP also have talked how do you protect your intellectual property right or your personal data. Employee employment you think is very interesting because uh, there is a myth that you know people will lose their job if, if, if AI come into play. But I think uh, uh, AI is actually uh, in the leadership how the how the leaders you know get those people on board and make them part of the program. There will be uh, mostly shift in the in the employment. People will have to be reskilled. This is mostly what's going to happen. And, and third party, I think they once talked about the risk in incident earlier, and this is the same kind in the whole ecosystem of AI, you will be finding third parties coming in. So how do you trust the third parties, like we call it the LLP, the providers who are coming with different kind of, of languages, and you're going to trust that and put that in your system and train that with your data. Loss is, I, I think it's, it's make very sense for me to mention it here, why these risks are being talked and need to be addressed. Uh, last year, uh, like uh, you can see on this slide, in the world first AI safety uh, summit, which took place in the UK, and this is one of the world greatest AI powers, they agree on the urgency behind understanding the risk of AI. And they, they quote it as this will help to ensure the long-term future of our children and grandchildren. And I think this is a big statement, and we really need to consider that on our journey to AI. Yes. Perfect. Agree completely. And a lot has been there was there was conferences at Bletchley Park to to bring back technology and all of us together and to understand just how big this impact is. And the Prime Minister of the UK attended those those conferences to show you just how importantly the UK sees this. All right, let's jump into the instant management ones. We are running out of time, so. <laughs> are you there, Terence? Sure. Um, I think we've spoken about most of the yeah. risks in various ways here. So um, I think we can maybe for the sake of time there. I mean, it's really just around uh, the. Just give me a sec here. Um, yeah, there's quite a few different areas there talking about, uh, yeah, what kind of, we, we spoke about the different types of post reviews that need to be performed, what kind of um, communication is obviously quite fundamental. Um, I had a question actually in another session I was presenting the other day where I was saying, well, what um, what am I legally required to report on? And when it comes to, to incidences, there's always big that question, so, okay, well, how far um, must, a, must a report on this? Now, there's obviously fines from a, um, when it comes to things like GDPR and from a South African perspective, we have Poppy, um, where yeah, once again those fines are implemented for um, release of uh, any any release um, releasing of uh, personal information. But it does come up to the individual to say, okay, well, should we <laughs> should we report back on uh, what kind of what kind of reporting should we do if we do incur an, an actual incident, and to what level do we do we report on it? Obviously the from a PR perspective, it would need to be worked out from an organizational perspective on how to um, produce it in sort of the public sector, uh, public um, domain. And um, I think we've seen a lot in, when it comes to reporting on breaches, let's say on the, the, there's been a lot of ransomware um, floating around the last couple of weeks as well. And uh, organizations obviously try and downplay it as much as possible to make it not look as detrimental to, to that organization. Uh, but at the same time, it's our obligation to ensure that we are securing a, an organization and by doing that we need to um, report to the various channels of what, what the incident was, what kind of details it is, and then it'll be up to a business decision of what are the next steps after that from a reporting perspective. Uh, I think we've spoken about the various parts of, of outdated tools and, and we all spoke earlier about the third party risk management. Um, the, the roles and responsibilities, I suppose, that always comes down to, we've seen a lot of organizations where um, the might be an instance where they have uh, uh, administrative users that aren't locked down effectively and um, have too many root users or too many admin users, which uh, is something that, that hardly gets looked at too much from, from my experience. 
Bivin, do you want to tackle? Maybe let's yeah, let's move on for the sake of time there onto those two areas. I think we've, we've got a minute left to talk about an incredible slide here about fully bringing it together with integration. I, I do think um, it's probably another topic we can talk about, but look at the middle section there to go. The integrated audits, I mentioned already about the, the quality and the management systems being integrated together, but the metrics, um, the laws, which are very closely aligned, all of the stuff, I think the guys have spoken very nicely about where the laws are closely aligned with AI, with privacy, with security, um, and the metrics and the audits can be used together. So, so we've got clients where you were doing a DORA audit together with a 27,701 audit, um, bringing it together with the management systems. So as we, are, as we are evolving, we're doing a lot of these things together. I'm very closely looking at the time. We did talk about risk management as being a critical aspect. And then when you're doing your policies, don't, you don't have to write a separate policy on AI. AI should be integrated into your policies already. It should be a component of security and privacy, should be a component of overall governance, should be integrated into your development. Having separate AI policies just because it's a buzzword isn't necessarily the right way to go. And that's why the slide is so useful for me in terms of that. And then, of course, business continuity, where understanding the disruptions and how all of this could affect business continuity and our interest response is obviously incident management is a critical part of business continuity. So the circles, they show you all the different areas of the standards and then show you how you can bring that together. When you look at these bullets, you'll see straight away how you could bring together the wording of, uh, of those different standards. So I think there is a last but on conclusions and takeaways. Tess, do you want to jump in quickly with the last minute on the conclusions and takeaways? Yeah, so uh, just to sum it up in one minute is I think uh, AI is here to stay. Uh, and it's going to bring amazing uh, value and Im Im amazing opportunity to businesses. How we go on that journey is very important. How do we take into consideration the risk into that is very important. Uh, what we are seeing in the 2020s is mostly into machine learning. What we are going to see in the next decade is, is about machine intelligence and which is going to be evolved to machine consciousness. So AI governance is a key component is important and must be adapt, adapted and to cover the broader implication like algorithm, accountability, explainability, and human oversight. So, yeah, uh, anything you want to add more, uh, Vivan and Tewans? Brilliant. I think that summarizes it well. There's a, a slide there about training and awareness and education. I think that's a critical part we probably haven't spoken that much about. But while we're doing seminars and things like this is about awareness. For all of you on the call, um, hopefully you have got something from this where you can go, all right, I need to think a bit more about this and tell more people about it. So awareness training are the critical things I think we can finish up on from here. Okay, Terence, you want to have a last 30 seconds before we jump off the call? <laughs> no, I think we've covered everything quite considerably there. I mean, maybe just that last point around the just to reiterate that is that, um, you know, with AI, we've spoken about so many different areas around AI um, advancing all the time, and we just need to try and, from from our, our perspective, from protecting our environments and uh, and ourselves as individuals as well, is that we need to keep an eye on these tools and be able to counteract them um, to a certain degree, but also understand their their processes so that um, it, yeah, it can't be used to further, further exploit anything without, within our environments. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, I did leave that one for you. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, I think uh, it's it's a wonderful topic and there's so much more about I would never have thought of actually bringing this together. Um, but by us doing the research, we could see how much we could actually bring together on this. So uh, thank you so much for the PCB and for all of you attending the course, uh, the, the conference. It was really nice to chat to you all and all the best. And good luck for the rest of the day. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Bevan, Tess, and Terence, for delivering this highly informative webinar. Now we are out of time, but uh, we'll just take some 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 more minutes to address some of the questions from the attendees. 
Okay, okay. so uh, let's continue with the first one, which is what governance structures need to be in place to facilitate effective communication between teams managing AI systems and those responsible for information security incidents? Great question. I think Terence, you're the best guy to answer that one. Well, no, Bivin, it's fine. You can take that one. I'll take the, the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so communication is obviously a critical thing. We talk about a lot in management systems. So the governance structures would be about how having a centralized person responsible um, for how AI and, and security talk to each other. And you would have a CISO and you would have someone in data management, as we spoke about there probably, who would then have a coordinated approach. So setting up a structure where artificial intelligence development and data management can talk and feed quickly into any response. And then the CISO and the security team would then deal with its response. But, but making sure that there's a, cons a, a, a continuous loop in terms of, of communication after that, I think is critical. Okay, thank you, Bevan. Okay, let's continue with the second question is, uh, for risk associated with a third party, how should they be treated once identified in the risk register? Should they be transferred to the third party? <laughs> it is, it looks like your type of question, I think, yeah? Jess, do you want to tackle it or? Okay. okay. I um, uh, we're talking about third party risk, so it, it is a very general question. Uh, when we there's different kind of third party risk, so depending on what is the risk, we will be able to assess whether we have we are going to treat it or whether we are going to accept it or to transfer it to another third party. There are many elements to take into consideration when we talk about risk management. Uh, it, it, it depends also on the impact that is going to have on the organization. If it is something that's very high and very uh, uh, require urgent attention, I don't think it is something that we are going to push to our third parties. And of course, it is going Even to just, have cost to that. Um, also, I, I I think we we've lost Bevan, right? Uh, if we're going, okay, let me just continue. Uh, if we're going to have a huge cost associated to that, then we can also maybe uh, look at some recompensating controls to mitigate those risks. So, like I said, it's, it's very general. It uh, always depends on what we are talking in here. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. So another one is, uh, what tools or technologies do you recommend for organizations looking to enhance their data and AI governance capabilities? <laughs> That's a very wide yeah. question. <laughs> I think we did show some of the tools there in terms of security tools. So that, that part there is covered. Um, from my side, we've got a, a partner or two who have got artificial intelligence solutions where they start your journey in terms of investigation. So, you, and there's specific tools that are that I should know about where they use the EU Act and they've integrated their solution into the EU Act to go and do discovery and then to do a, a risk assessment on your solution um, in terms of AI. So, I would look at those. There are quite a few of those solutions out there where they look at risk and they look at solutions in AR. And if someone wants to ping me afterwards, I'll actually give you names, because right now, yeah, we're in a very short timeline of those sort of solutions where you can do it. There are obviously a lot of vendors out there who've jumped into the AR game to do AR risk specifically and AR solutions, looking at um, understanding how you would best use AR in your company. Uh, things like Copilot we've mentioned already is obviously a key one doing a lot on that as well. Mm. But I think even from, I mean, Microsoft and um, Amazon have even done steps towards, you know, um, identifying data in AWS, for example, within the S3 buckets to try and identify what type of information is, is purview from a defender perspective under Microsoft to also try and identify what kind of classification of information there is. Obviously, they're all features and they're all additional cost per month, but um, there's maybe look at also a lot of the inherent tools that you've got already. We do find that with a lot of clients where they Maybe looking for different types of products, and it's they probably even have it under their licenses currently. Um, I know a lot of market, the models are changing now to be more of an individual cost level more than sort of bundled approaches, but uh, it, 
to just consider what you do have in your environment. I mean, um, there's even the things like you know, Dropbox is also looking at other areas around that and other types of like storage mechanisms for, for those purposes. So um, yeah, consider it. But there are millions of applications for <laughs> different types of data scanning and uh, looking for things like yeah. credit card numbers. There's a whole host of tools for, for that as well if you're looking down that, that route as well. All right, brilliant. Cool. Okay, thank you very much. So unfortunately, due to time constraints, we'll have to conclude this today's webinar. Uh, to the attendees, thank you very much for joining. Please be informed that the recorded session along with the slides of the presentation will be shared with all webinar registrants in the upcoming week. Thank you very much to the presenters as well. Have a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.